All right, so thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Rachel Ball, uh, and I'm delighted to welcome our guest for this evening, Professor Bliss Lim. Um, so she's Associate Professor of Film and Media Studies at the University of California at Irvine, member of the Editorial Collective at Camera Obscura, and her expertise in transnational horror film, as well as in camp cult and queer cinema, really makes her the ideal guest to help us unpack what we've just seen. Um, so please wow. join me in welcoming Bliss Lim. <laughs> Thank you, Rachel. <laughs> the ideal guest to unpack flesh for Frankenstein. I'm not sure how I feel about that. Quite a compliment. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so I'd like to start with probably the most memorable line in the film, to know death, Otto, you can say it with me if you want, uh, you have to life in the gallbladder. Uh, spoken, of course, after Baron Frankenstein has done just that. Uh, so this is a moment that's pretty shocking in its audaciousness, it's gross, and it's also, probably most importantly, really, really funny. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a moment that encapsulates, I think, what's really unique about this film, and it's sort of hybrid genre and tone. Um, so does this moment actually help us unpack the film's tone? Yeah, I think so. Um, it is a remarkable line uttered in what one critic has rightly called one of the most bizarre copulation scenes in the history of film. Um, because Baron Frankenstein is, is so interested in having sort of taped up very decorously the genitalia and then wants to penetrate um, the female zombie through her stomach incision. And you know that I think the gallbladder and the slurping of the armpits. I just have to uh, just get it all out there. I think are uh, you know make this film extraordinarily unique. Uh, and however, you know definitely an acquired taste, and maybe some of you have acquired it. Um, and Paul Morrissey, the director of this film, has talked uh, at length in early interviews around 1973 when this film was released about what he meant by that line. And really what it is is a kind of send up of one of his pet peeves, which is what he considered to be um, pretentious art films about serious important themes. And he said that he and Andy Warhol uh, in, in working to create Flesh for Frankenstein and its companion piece, Blood for Dracula, which was, um, which was made back to back, really, uh, in Italy, is that they wanted to make the antithesis of an important art film and make a film that was anti-serious and that film reviewers would be forced not to review. And what he had really in mind was, um, he was his bet noir was really Last Tango in Paris, which was released the prior year, a uh, film by Bertolucci. And it was an X-rated film. And, and like Flesh for Frankenstein, this was really a moment when X-rated films were able to be shown in mainstream theaters. 72, 73, you also have er earlier in the late 60s, you have Midnight Cowboy. And um, Last Tango in Paris has two anal sex scenes. And what really annoyed Paul Morrissey is that Mar Marlon Brando gives a speech that is really directed towards the audience, in which he's telling the audience and the diegetic characters that the anal sex scene is not about anal sex, but is about important, serious themes like uh, the dissolution of the family, existential angst, and social hypocrisy. And really, Paul Morrissey hated this. He thought that was the height of hypocrisy. So I think Marlon Brando's line is, I want to get it right, you won't be able to look death right in the face until you go up right into the act of death. And so that is what is being sent up by Otto, the assistance line, to know, I think it's to know life, Otto, you have to fuck death in the gallbladder. Um, and it leads us into many other questions, right, uh, about the kind of tonal and generic singularity of the film. Yeah, so kind of as a follow-up, uh, what would you consider to be the genre or genres of this film? Right. Um, so I think it's very clear that it has horrific and pornographic elements, but that it is not, not in any way a conventional horror film, and not in any way, I think, a conventional pornographic film. And that's because it's too preposterous and ridiculous to be scary. And I think, um, I'm not sure, I can't speak for every audience member, but I would say that the audience response is largely ironic rather than orgasmic, at least in the first uh, instance. Um, but you know, the critic who's spoken very interestingly about horror and pornography, 
uh, as well as melodrama, is really Linda Williams, right? The feminist film critic who talks about this idea of the body genre. So the body genre is a kind of film in which the spectacle of an on-screen body in the grips of an intense sensation, whether it's weeping in melodrama, orgasm in porn, or terror in horror, uh, elicits a kind of answering or mirroring emotional and physical response in the spectator, who also has a visceral jolt effect. We're also aroused, or we're also weeping, or we're also terrified. But those things don't exactly happen in this film, and I feel that there's a kind of ironic distanciation. Those things may be at play, but we have a kind of detachment. So I think that the genre, if we can speak of one, uh, for this film is more the gross out film. So there was some, someone uh, behind me who was saying, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, throughout uh, the screening, no judgment. And when I show um, the companion film to this, Blood for Dracula, I teach in my class, Global Horror, really there are just cries of, oh gross, that just, um, you know, Blood for Dracula has a lot of vomiting and vomiting blood, just a lot of it, long takes of vomiting blood. And um, you know, here, of course, we have the slurping armpit. We have many other things, the, the kind of orgasmic fondling of innards, you know, anything. I can't believe I'm saying this while also being on TV. It's kind of remarkable <laughs> to be recorded saying these things. Um, but when my undergraduates say it, or when I say it, oh, gross, I think William Paul is right. When we say, oh, gross, we're not condemning the film. Um, we're actually enjoying it. And so what he says is the mark of the gross out film is this kind of ambivalence on the part of, of the audience where we are fascinated because we are repulsed. It is repellent, therefore we enjoy it. And that's what he calls the fun aesthetic of gross out, which is that we're allowed to indulge in a kind of pleasure that in ordinary life and polite society we wouldn't be allowed to. Definitely. Um, I'm also interested, kind of on a related note, uh, so this is a film in which high and lowbrow mm. film practices come together yeah. on many different levels. Um, so we have a director responsible for some of the most famous films to come out of Andy Warhol's Factory Collective. For instance, uh, we also have performers like Udo Kier as Baron Frankenstein, um, who's had a long and rich collaboration with both avant-garde and exploitation filmmakers. Could you tell us a bit about the production of this film uh, and maybe some of the ways that it brings together what can seem on its face to be two very different um, artistic allegiances? Yeah. So I'll begin, so I absolutely agree with you that the film uh, really straddles highbrow and lowbrow in very interesting ways. And let's start with Udo Kier, and then we'll unpack maybe Warhol's Factory and, and Paul Morrissey. But Udo Kier uh, was famous, you know, famously recalls that he was on a flight with Paul Morrissey. He was 21, very good looking. He told Paul Morrissey he was an actor, and a few months later he was cast in this film. And Paul Morrissey, um, uh, sorry, and uh, Udo Kier has, of course, a very kind of long and brilliant career working with some of the best known auteurs in world cinema. So Herzog, Fassbinder, Lars von Trier, the list goes on. But he's also been in Ace Ventura starring alongside Jim Carrey. And um, so he, he does span this highbrow, lowbrow. And he says, you know, in interviews, I've made 200 films, 100 of them are bad. And he's proud of it. And he says that, you know, high or low, what drove him to make those films is that, you know, quote, I want to do unusual things on screen. And he definitely did some unusual <laughs> things in this film. Um, and then to, you know, kind of Paul Morrissey and Andy Warhol, as you, as you mentioned, one of the reasons why this film straddles sort of you know, high art and low culture is, of course, its association with Andy Warhol's factory, which was his New York studio in the late 60s and early 70s. And that was really the epicenter of some of the kind of structural films that Andy War early structural films that Andy Warhol was known for, like Eat, Sleep, Empire. And those films are nothing like Flesh for Frankenstein or Blood for Dracula. And there were definitely people, detractors at the factory, who strongly disliked Paul Morrissey, saw him as a conservative figure, um, a managerial figure, and they blame him for sort of turning Andy Warhol away from the true underground or avant-garde scene towards a kind of commercializing, entertainment-oriented um, tendency that you see in Flesh for Frankenstein. But you know, the critic who's written the most about this is Joan Hawkins in a book called Cutting Edge, I think, The Horror and the Horrific Avant-Garde. 
And I'm persuaded by her claim that that's really fundamentally a misreading of Andy Warhol and Paul Morrissey, that um, both of them, uh, their friendship was in part based on the fact that they were, avant-garde figures were strongly drawn to popular culture. They loved stardom, they loved celebrity, they loved fandom, they loved popular culture. And that kind of, that kind of like love for low popular pleasures and indulgences infused with a very experimental edge, I think is absolutely at work in Flesh for Frankenstein. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so one thing that's related to this, right, is the question of authorship. Right. Um, so originally this film's marketed as Andy Warhol's Frankenstein right. and Blood for Dracula was Andy Warhol's Dracula. Um, and often a lot of the films in Morrissey's filmography are erroneously credited to Warhol as mm -hmm. director. Mm -hmm. um, there were some rumors that Italian genre director Antonio Margheriti actually directed this whole film, though he was the second unit director as crew members and actors have um, sort of corrected the record. Um, so could you maybe untangle a little bit this issue of authorship in Flesh for Frankenstein? Yeah, so there's no question that Paul Morrissey directed this film. Um, and he also scripted it. And he said that Andy Warhol gave him some financing, uh, but most of the financing actually came from European producers, French, German, um, and primarily Italian, Carlo Ponti. Uh, and he said that beyond that, Warhol gave him complete artistic freedom. But definitely the fact that Warhol lent his name and a kind of brand name uh, to usher these films onto the market and onto international distribution is, is absolutely important and significant. So I think the question is less who authored this, this film, because that question is re really answerable by Paul Morrissey. And much more the question, the much more interesting question is probably, you know, what does the fact of, you know, Paul Morrissey's filmmaking combined with Warhol's name, what does that do and what does that enable? And I think the answer is a crossover film. Right? And so Joe D'Alessandro, who is a star of many of the Warhol uh, Morrissey factory films, so Flesh, Heat, Trash, as well as Blood for Dracula and Flesh for Frankenstein, in this film he's the lusty stable boy Nicholas who uh, Baroness Frankenstein takes as a lover. Uh, he spoke in his early 1970s interviews about the fact that the Italian producers and the European producers were willing to get behind these films. So they were very cheaply made. Both Flesh and Dracula were made back to back. They finished one film and started the next, the next film the same day, later the same day, for $600,000. And they were willing to give that money on three conditions. First is that Paul Morrissey should direct. Second is that Joe D'Alessandro should star. And third is that Warhol should lend his name. And the reason for this three-part formula is that they thought that was the key to the success of, the, of um, Flesh, uh, Trash, and Heat, which were these factory films that, that did extremely well in the underground, and they were about um, sex and drugs in the New York scene in the, in the late 60s. And so what the European producers wanted, therefore, was this formula which they, with which they could make a low-budget, sex horror flick, right? This is one of the definitions of Euro horror is this combination of horror and pornography, but that they could market it as a racy art film. And Joan Hawkins says that's exactly what they got. But perhaps the real surprise is, or, or at least the unexpected element, is that commercial audiences flocked to it, right? This was a huge commercial success. Um, so in the US, it, so it was made for $300,000. It grossed $5 million by the end of 1974. It was the 16th highest grossing film in its year. And in part, its capacity to reach such enormous audiences was that it was not released as an underground film. So it didn't play in a small, you know, not-for-profit underground venue. And it wasn't released as a porn film. It did not play in a grindhouse theater on Skid Row. Rather, it was released in mainstream cinemas and in art cinemas, and it attracted a primarily youth audience like yourselves um, who were drawn to the countercultural avant-garde mystique of the Warhol name and wanted to be entertained by something scandalous. And you know, they got what they wanted. And this was really a moment, I think, where audiences were, were starting to experiment with ironic pleasure. And um, you know, film historians talk about you know, the post-war years, 60s, 70s onwards, as a moment when audiences are starting to realize the most interesting things are out at the edges. So the kind of fringe pleasure that Flesh for Frankenstein offers. <laughs>
Yeah, so on the subject of fringe pleasures, <laughs> um, so there's a difference, as you've been saying, between an author's intent and a reader of a film's yeah. reading or reception. Mm -hmm. um, so there are many films that can be more earnestly made with an attempt to arouse or frighten that could still be greeted with the same kind of laughter that we right. greeted this film with, right? So what do we know about Paul Morrissey's tonal intent with this film? Did he have like a stated message or project? Um, so in the DVD bonus feature that I watched last week, uh, which he made decades after uh, Flesh for Frankenstein, <laughs> Um, he says that these films were comedies. He thinks of Flesh for Frankenstein as a comedy. And he said that he always thought that both violence and sex, which were regarded as sacred cows, were absolutely kind of absurd. Sex in particular, he thought, was very funny. And he thought that sex was an opportunity to show people being foolish. And that if he could cast really good looking people behaving foolishly, that would be wonderful. And so he, I think he's absolutely done it. I think the Baroness is kind of terrifyingly beautiful because her eyebrowless beauty is definitely <laughs> astonishing uh, and singular. And so looking back at Flesh for Frankenstein, he says he's proud of it. He thinks it's a great film. And he thinks that it is a great film because it has a personality. He says so few films have a distinct or unique tone of voice, a distinct personality. And part of it, he thinks comes from his process. So when he made uh, the, fil the early films at the factory, they were improvisational. There were just a few people on set and there was no script. And that's what he intended to do when he got to Italy. But when he got to Rome and he was uh, shooting at the very famous studios Cinecitta, and he admired them, he thought these were great Italian craftspeople, great uh, filmic technicians, but, and, I, and I think you see it, there's so much polish in the film, it's so technically polished while also being sort of stilted and horribly acted, you know, it was amazing, gorgeous, strange, weird film. And when he got there, you know, he had this, these huge crews, 50 people on set, most of them couldn't speak English, and he realized, oh, this improvisational thing's not, not gonna work. So he ended up writing those zingers that we are laughing about. Um, what my favorite one is, how could you wake me up in the middle of the day when you know I have insomnia, right? <laughs> For some reason, this is my favorite line in the film. Um, and you know, he wrote those in the morning and then they went on to shoot them later in the day. So he says that there is really nothing like these films, Blood for Dracula or Flesh for Frankenstein, nothing before them or nothing after them that is quite like them. And it's because of the process. Um, partly the kind of Warhol, Morrissey, factory sensibility that walks into it, but also this, this process of doing this in Italy. And he says that they then bear the mark of somebody, a filmmaker who wanted to do it his own way and was miraculously allowed to do so. And I think that really is the, singular, the tonal singularity of this film. Mm. So to that kind of singularity or strangeness in the tone. Um, I think we can ask what kinds of audience reading strategies are pertinent to this film. Right. Um, you kind of wonder when you're watching it, um, is it high camp when Udo Kier is sort of chewing the scenery? Is it so bad it's good when we all laugh instead of scream at the gardening shear contraption? Right. Um, so do these negotiated reading strategies have to do with the film's refusal to sort of conform to standardized genre mm -hmm. um, labels like horror or porn? Mm -hmm. So I think, so yes, I think it has everything to do with the kind of, of hybrid uh, genre. So this film has been talked about primarily in two ways around audience reading strategies. And I just wanna do the caveat that there's no way to, to talk about what every audience member will do. But the first way is um, a paracinematic embrace of trash. And so this film, uh, a film scholar, Jeff Sconce, has talked about um, paracinematic audiences as audiences who really wanna deliberately uphold and champion trashy, low, disreputable films and really kind of challenge the, um, the reigning taste hierarchy that puts kind of art cinema or canonical cinema at the top of legitimate film culture. And while I think that that may be at work, I don't think it's necessarily primary, at least to how I watch it or how my students have seen Blood for Dracula. I don't think we sit there thinking, yes, and this, this I will use to challenge 
Citizen Kane. I mean, I don't know that that is exactly the first thing that comes to mind. And so I feel like maybe it's closer to what Susan Sontag and um, Babuccio have talked about as the camp sensibility. So camp is, as you say, this, this idea which prizes failure, which, which, which says it's so bad it's good. It's good because it's awful or there's a good taste of bad taste. And it loves theatricality and excess and artifice. All of that is there. Um, but I think what's interesting in Susan Sontag is that she says camp then, with its ironic laughter and its detachment, really neutralizes moral indignation. So this film has incest, this film has necrophilia, this film has decapitation, many other things, but we don't bring any kind of moral indignation to it. Um, but the camp sensibility is also very strongly tied to queer communities and um, to the gay experience, right? So this is Babuccio's point that, that Sontag overlooks the fact that so much of the bitter wit of camp really comes from uh, a gay experience of homophobia and seeing past the social mask to a kind of submerged or repressed sexual or social contradiction. And I think that's at work in the film, those weird long tracking shots of that really aristocratic dining table where everybody is sitting polite and well-dressed, but they're in the company of monsters and, and the aristocrats are themselves monsters is that kind of bitter wit of seeing behind the social mask. And of course, Udo Kier is an androgynously beautiful kind of queer cult icon, and Joe D'Alessandro in his day was also a, a kind of gay cult icon who attracted huge gay audiences um, that helped uh, spur the commercial success of this film. So this is a film, as we've been talking about, mm. right, where bodies are at the very center, mm. um, but they're bodies that behave sort of strangely, right? <laughs> yeah. So they're bursting at the seams, it seems, yeah. ready to spill open at any minute. Um, so we can see this when Otto sort of casually disembowels a chambermaid. Um, Olga. Olga, or when Frankenstein's hand is dramatically severed when it's gently bumped by a closing door. Um, so. <laughs> There's also this way in which the organs sort of shoot out towards the audience uh -huh. or they're thrust in our faces. Mm. So could you speak to the nature or maybe the function of these splattering and spurting organs? Right, so this is a film that's obsessed with wounds and scars and bodies spilling out. And um, I think scar tissue is, or, or sutures, long sutures, uh, are also on the poster, the original poster of Flesh for Frankenstein. And Paul Morrissey had said, this film was made in 1973, that he made it for Andy, so for Andy Warhol. So in 1968, as most of us know, a radical lesbian feminist, author of the Scum Manifesto, Valerie Solanas, shot um, Andy Warhol. And Andy then confided to Morrissey, Morrissey recalls, um, that, that he managed to survive that shooting, but only after five and a half hours on an operating table, after which he felt, you know, after the surgery, that he had just been barely glued together and that he, his insides might pop out at any moment. And so Morrissey said that he made the film for Andy uh, to exercise those fears of your body popping out uh, through this kind of raucous humor. Um, but of course, the film was initially released in 3D. Um, and I, I just wish that I could watch it in 3D and I, I'm trying to imagine it while I'm sitting there. Um, the huge pincers and the kind of spurting blood and all of that. Um, and the, I guess the liver on a spear. So all of this would be thrust out onto the audience. And Paul Morrissey said that this wasn't his initial idea. One of the European producers pitched it to him. He thought it was ridiculous and therefore appealing. And he wanted to do this. And, and um, one of the authors who's written is Maurice Yakuar, who wrote a book on Paul Morrissey's film, says that the 3D effect then becomes a kind of a form of sexual displacement. So the whole film is about sexual displacement, right? That's why there's like the love of the armpits and the love of the, gall the gallbladder. But there's also the kind of sexual displacement of the thrusting penetrative movement going towards the audience through 3D. And of course, what, then, what that then does is, is make another genre home, generic home for this film, which is the splatter film. And Michael Arnzen says that you know, other kinds of horror are about supernatural horror or the fear of, let's say, a psychologically um, a, an obsessed killer like in Psycho. But in Flesh for Frankenstein, the fear of, of splatter horror is really the fear of the body coming apart. 
And um, that special effects are harnessed always in the splatter film to the spectacle of a body completely kind of spilling out and splattering. Yeah. So to return to Maurice Yekua, yeah. um, so he has this interesting reading um, where everything sort of centers on Paul Morrissey's supposed conservatism. Mm. Um, and he's sort of reading Flesh for Frankenstein as this condemnation of libertinism or sexual excesses. So how do you kind of feel about that reading? So I, I think that, you know, Paul Morrissey says that there is no morality in his films because he thinks that a kind of that, that kind of morality or serious critique is silly, right? And and kind of pretentious. And I think you see it at work in these films. So you could say that um, the Baron and Baroness in Flesh for Frankenstein are done to death by their own sexual licentiousness. But, uh, oh, and you could say that Joe D'Alessandro with his remarkable New York accent alone among all of the, um, the European uh, characters in the film, um, therefore, I think Yakuar argues that he represents American vibrancy and democracy and he's therefore the hero. But Paul Morrissey says, I have no favorites among these, these characters. I love them all equally. Um, and indeed, Joe D'Alessandro's character gets eviscerated in the film. So this is a film which has aspects like sexual decadence, or it has aspects like racial des undesirability, right? This whole discourse of like some master race that is kind of racially pure, or it has um, themes of sexual dysfunction, or, or the family is a hypocritical institution, but none of them are dealt with, I think, very seriously. Yeah, so sort of to that point, um, one of the changes from Mary Shelley's novel is, um, sort of bringing to the fore this idea of generation and reproduction. Mm. Um, so unlike in the novel, um, Frankenstein here already has two children of his own, right. in addition to the monstrous progeny. Mm. Um, and unlike the novel, he's already created a female creature, and it's not created under duress. It's this idea of the master race through reproduction. Right. Um, so what do you make of this emphasis on procreative birth and legacy? So. Um, Okay, so I'm forgetting who talks about this, but there's a particular reading of incest in Flesh for Frankenstein as a sort of allusion to incest in the original novel. So in Mary Shelley's novel, uh, Victor Frankenstein has a dream of Elizabeth, his betrothed, and in his, in his dream, after he kisses her, she turns into the decaying corpse of Victor Frankenstein's dead mother. Right? So this is widely read as a kind of incestuous, kind of uh, libidinal moment in um, the novel. And of course, this film sort of takes that and sort of literalizes it. Uh, Baron Frankenstein and his wife are brother and sister. But there's a critic who says that this is an incestuous but sexless marriage, and that the, um, the, brother, the, the, the two children, the two sinister children in the film, were likely conceived out of wedlock, right? Uh, um, with another lover, right? Um, and in fact, uh, Paul Morrissey seems to kind of give credence to that reading because when he's talking about this film in his commentary, he says that it's much more about property relations. And, and the Countess even says, like, we're together for the children, we're together for the property. Um, and it's, you know, so that kind of submerged class critique is there within the idea of monstrous progeny. But again, the film is so sort of ironic and detached and funny and absurd that it doesn't really run with it, right? Mm. Um, but I did want to say something about the monstrous progeny, and those children are really creepy. Um, and one of the reasons is, I forget who said this, but um, they don't speak English. And I think you and I were talking about this, but I think, so Euro horror could be filmed, um, so European horror films made for an international international market for low budget could be filmed with a cast that came of, of actors that came from all over the world. And so multiple languages were often spoken on set and then dubbed later by the distributor. But in this film, I think they were primarily speaking English, whether or not that was location sound or post dubbed. And the children didn't speak it. So they're very quiet in the film. And that I think all the boy ever says is no papa. No, Papa, right? And that makes them even more sinister as their, their silence makes them sinister as they play with their pet lung on a respirator or they, you know, proceed to eviscerate the survivor, you know, Joe D'Alessandro. 
Yeah, so you mentioned this a little bit, but I wondered if we might think about it a mm -hmm. bit more. Um, this interesting notion of class yeah. sort of exploitation, mm -hmm. um, the fact that we have this um, European peasantry that also has a member who seems to be from Brooklyn, um, right. that the exploitation is also sexual. Right. I think it's this really interesting um, sort of tangle in this film. Like, is there maybe... Right, class, sex, as well as race. So in uh, Mary Shelley's novel, uh, there's a, there are two uh, little girls who are adopted, and one is adopted to be a daughter, and another is adopted to be a peasant, to be a servant. And um, the line in the novel about that adoption is about the kind of racial elements of their features, that the dark-eyed vagrant one could only ever be part of the working class. And the fair-skinned, blue-eyed one could actually be um, adopted into the aristocratic family. So that class is always sort of strongly racialized, right? Um, in a novel that was also about the dream of creating a better, purer race that then becomes monstrous progeny, right? But in this film, you know, I think those things are at work, but again, also in a kind of send-up, right? So, um, so there are elements of class in the film. Um, and, and a similar thing where they need a kind of Greek, like a latter-day Greek nose, which would have come through Serbia. Um, and you know, to that, Paul Morrissey actually cast a Yugoslavian actor, so that, that uh, Sasha, who has the nasum, right? Um, so this idea, again, of like uh, somebody who's racially desirable from the peasant class, promoted to the aristocracy or to, to to, to be part of the world of the aristocracy, but then that fails monstrously. Yeah. Great, so I think we're ready now to open up to audience questions. Okay. So uh, I really like the way you guys were talking about the, you know, the ambivalences, and particularly I can't help thinking about the comment that Rachel, you made about somebody calling Morrissey conservative. Mm -hmm. But you know, when Delacentro comes up, the armpit scene, I mean, suddenly you see his entire body and he's standing up, right? And you'd really hit with it. There's no joke there. Mm -hmm. Of course, immediately it goes into the pit thing, mm -hmm. but that's a pretty standard part of, I guess, gay sexuality mm -hmm. because people talk about pits all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, that's really, that, that scene really stood out for me in terms of the kind of shift in tone so quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, but within a certain kind of subculture, it may not even have been a shift in tone. Mm. It's just us putting a certain kind of frame on it. Mm. Um, but Bliss, I want to actually collude with you at this moment and put Rachel in the hot seat. Okay, because, let's do it. Uh, Rachel, after all, I believe you were part of the curating team and you sort of suggested this, or you had a lot to do with the choosing of this film in this uh, series. So can you tell us a little bit about why? and how that maybe relates to your interests. Oh, that was my question for her. Why Flesh for Frankenstein? <laughs> Tell us, Rachel. Questions for me. Um, oh, well. Uh, well, a little bit of it was sort of happenstance because I've been wanting to program Blood for Dracula for a long time. And then um, the Frankenstein 200th year anniversary came up and I thought, oh my god, Flesh for Frankenstein, why not? Um, but I also think it really works as a Frankenstein film on multiple levels because we do have these very gory special effects, which are sort of another kind of bodily technology um, and sort of participating in um, the same sort of lineage of terrifying technology that changes um, our very biomatter. Mm -hmm. So I think for that reason, it's pretty interesting as well. Mm -hmm. And camp pleasure too. Yes. <laughs> um, I wanted to say something that I was thinking about when you talked about, you're talking about the full frontal long shot of Joe D'Alessandro in the mirror, right? As a kind of standard shot of gay porn, right? And I was thinking that there is a kind of strong and maybe serious queer sexuality in the film. And I think it's the longing looks, the intense off-screen gaze 
of the Sasha character in The Bordello, right? And the complete failure of heterosexual sex in this film, right? It's like, oh, copulate, you know, the, the female and male zombie, and they keep looking down, and there's a complete failure of arousal. Um, but, but the kind of real libidinal energy is really of Sasha looking at um, Joe D'Alessandro. And I can't help but thinking that that's a placeholder there for, for the kind of gay audiences for this film. Hi. Hi. Thank you again for having us watch this very, very strange movie. <laughs> um, I wondered if you could talk a little bit, Bliss, about, about the role of music in this film, because oh, I thought right. the soundtrack was just really fascinating. Yeah, this is from our conversation in the green room, which was getting more grotesque at the longer our conversation. The kind of strange <laughs> thing about talking about Flesh for Frankenstein is after a little bit, you're starting to talk about the length of suture stitches and so on. Yeah, I was watching this and thinking about music the first time, but it was even more so. Uh, it really struck me in the Pollock Theater with the great sound system here. I think that um, I'm, I'm struck by the fact that so much of the music was classical music, right? And I think that there is a kind of play, the ironic reversal or the ironic humor in this film is a play uh, with the decorum that is usually associated with classical music when it's scoring these kind of weird, disemboweling, grotesque, erotic scenes. Um, there's one scene where he's talking about his dreams for the master race uh, while someone is on the kind of autopsy table and then a music box plays and there's also the real weird birdcage music that, you know, as Patrice said, yeah, the kids will surely go to sleep to that creepiest <laughs> kind of bedtime music you'd ever hear. And then um, a little later on, again, uh, around a vivisection scene, there's a kind of trumpet fanfare and you thought that that was... I thought maybe that was from Wagner, but right. I could be wrong. Right. So there's this kind of... Uh, so non-diegetic music means music that's not coming from the story world. So there's all of this except for the birdcage. But then there's also the sound design is very strong around those, that, that classical decorum that is constantly being overturned by the image track and by the narrative events. But then it's also very invested in exactly one diegetic sound other than dialogue, and it is the slurping of the armpit, right? <laughs> and so that's the kind of sound design of the film in a nutshell. And I think you know, all of its tongue-in-cheek pleasure can even be distilled to the sound design. So yeah, this is either for Bliss um, or Rachel. Um, so I'm interested in this uh, question of technology because when the film begins, you have this very short horse and a cart, and you're thinking, why don't they have better, a better oh. carriage you know, when they go oh. up to the... And then the technology remains very low key. It's almost substandard. Some of it in the, in the lab is there's no special effects related to technology itself, right? I mean, even the thing in which the heart is there looks like a gramophone or something that you'd have in your living room. And, but what is technological is the pieces of anatomy, you know, the gallbladder, the liver, and you end up with the lungs and heart, which is just a gorgeous shot. And so I'm wondering if there's another <laughs> kind of You said that on record, that's exciting. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm just you know, curious about that, whether he's trying to actually shift us away from Frankenstein's technological mythos to something else. Yeah. You can go first. Uh, I mean, I think that's wonderfully put. Um, I do think you're definitely right that it is this sort of wetware, right, where the organ is the technology. Um, it was interesting that moment with the the sort of electrical machine where you get these almost like Rothko colors when you turn the switches. Um, yeah, I don't really have a polished thought on this, but. Yeah, so I'm, I'm more familiar actually with Dracula, the novel, rather than um, Frankenstein. But they both come from this kind of 19th century moment that kind of Chivalbush, like Wolfgang Chivalbush talks about around, um, you know, around technological modernity, uh, ideas of technological reproduction like the gramophone, but also the train, right? And if you read Chivalbush, he, he talks about the horse and carriage as definitely the pre-19th century moment that is then replaced by the train. But there is no train in this film. There's just a very sad small pony and then a, a small cart. And it's that kind of weird pastoral scene I was watching with you guys. And you know, this is really just filmed a few feet outside of the sound stages of Chinachita. Uh, 
and it's just beautiful meadows all over there and, and actual castles and stuff. And so it gives like a kind of earlier pastoral feeling to what should be a kind of 19th century modern novel. That's my only thought, other than to say that the biggest technological moment in this film was prepare the organs, and then basically they make a smoothie. <laughs> it was <laughs> astonishing. It was like some kind of organ smoothie that they were making. Yeah, that was, that was their technological moment, yeah. All right, so thank you guys so much for coming. Um, this was awesome, and please thank you. help me thank Bliss. Thank you, Rachel. Thanks, you guys. Thank you, Emily. Thanks, everyone, for having me.